Very good afternoon to all and all. I hope uh, you all have had a wonderful session so far. So I welcome you all once again for NASCOM Technology Leadership Forum 2023. And here we are going to discuss on the topic, Roadmap for Digital Skilling for Future of Work. So technology has been advancing at a very rapid pace and revolutionizing the way we interact, work with each other. So at uh, NTLF 23, uh, we are here, we are proud to present this panel discussion where we are going to <coughs> discuss about building the future ready workforce. So <coughs> join us in uh, welcoming our panelists. We are going to provide their insights on building a future ready workforce and the challenges and, and equipping them in the challenges, overcoming the challenges for, this, uh, for the uh, workforce of the future. So now I would like to first invite uh, Ms. Indosin Divya, the Managing Director, Tamil Nadu Skill Development Corporation. Please come to that. Next, I would invite uh, Mr. Arish Krishnan, Managing Director and Chief Policy Officer, Cisco India and Saad. Dr. Reema Ghosh Chowdhury, Executive Vice President and CHRO, Datamatics Global Services Limited. Mr. Hari Balachandran, CEO of ICT Act. Uh, Mr. Sujit Kumar, AVP and HR, Business Leader Infosys Limited, who is going to chair the session. Welcome, one and all. Would you like to take the front seats before we start here? Excuse me. Sorry. Sir. Sir. Mitra. So as we settle in, so let me take a quick two to three minute uh, intro into the speakers because it's very important to get to know the eminent panelists sitting here because this is a very illustrious panel. You have somebody from the industry, you have somebody representing the Skill Development Corporation of Tamil Nadu. So I'm going to introduce uh, Madam Innocent Divya to the audience. Uh, and she's the Managing Director of uh, TNSDC, uh, Tamil Nadu Skill Development Corporation. Uh, who's on a large mission to skilling uh, students in TM. She's a 2009 batch IAS officer and former collector of uh, Neil Reese district. Uh, and uh, she, uh, prior to that role, she was also the deputy secretary to the late CM Dr. Jayalalitha. Uh, so has rich experience of uh, working in Tamil Nadu. We called her as a firebrand IAS officer back in TM. Uh, so great to have you here, ma'am. A uh, big round of applause to the IAS. I have Dr. Mr. Harish Krishnan. Uh, I was a little taken aback by the place where he came from. He's from Gurgaon and he speaks very fluent Tamil. Uh, he's the MD, Managing Director and Chief Policy Officer of Cisco Systems uh, India and SARC. And in his current role, Harish works with the national and state government on a wide range of public policy issues that uh, concern Cisco India. An industry veteran over 30 years. Uh, with the rich experience of working with brands like IBM and CII. So, big round of applause to our panelist, Mr. Harish Krishnan. To Dr. Reema, uh, a fellow HR professional, a seasoned HR professional with over two decades of experience in corporate and academia. Reema has been responsible for building technology and leadership capabilities in uh, reputed global enterprises like IBM, Sony Pictures, and so on and so forth. So, great to have you in this panel, Dr. Reema. And fourth, and our final panelist is Mr. Hari Balachandar, CEO of ICT Academy, based in Chennai again, and he has over 25 years in the field of education, and only education, he wants to proudly claim that. Uh, he's been with uh, NIT Pearson and currently the CEO of ICT Academy. So, one thing common among these panelists, uh, quite a few of us are coughing. Um, <laughs> so please pardon with that. Yeah. Hopefully you, you don't catch up. Yeah. 
So we have a very interesting task, and of course the topic is this is a burning topic. It's been discussed in multiple uh, forums. But as a moderator, what's very challenging is uh, to look at this illustrious panel um, who are on a different mission of scaling. So if, if what Rima and I will focus on is largely on what our organization is doing. Uh, Hari focuses on the larger student uh, uh, community. Uh, Cisco partners with the government in various aspects, so he's going to touch upon that. And of course the canvas, what uh, Innocent Divya Man is going to talk about is, is very, very different. It's, it's, it's a large canvas that we can't even think about. So uh, sit back and enjoy our other panel. Uh, we have about a few interesting questions to each of these panelists. But, and towards the end, we will throw it open to the audience. If you have any questions, please do reserve <coughs> towards the end of the session. Yeah, are we good to go? Great. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Rima. Um, because we are talking about digital skilling for the future. So the question is very simple. What does digital future of work look like? And how important it is for skilling for the future? And why do you think it is very, very important? If you can just help us summarize, then we'll take it off from there. Sure. Um, thank you, Sajeev. And uh, a big thank you to NASCOM for organizing this very relevant forum today and uh, the kind of panel that we have. So I'm sure I am looking forward to a lot of learning from audience interactions and the speakers. And I also intend to share a little bit about what, NAS uh, about what uh, Datamax, Datamatics is doing. So uh, when it comes to how uh, uh, the roadmap, the topic today and what Sujit mentioned, I, I would borrow from uh, Dickens uh, to say that this is the best of times, this is the worst of times because one thing is very clear that change is all pervasive be it in terms of technology or in terms of times and uh, just a while back, probably a year back we were talking about a situation where there were candidates who were coming in with five, six offers and we were struggling. We have committed to client that Monday morning the resource will show up and nobody shows up and you cannot even contact that person. So that was the situation. I see some smiles and I know that probably you have also gone through the same situation and see how suddenly tables have changed, have turned and we see that in US itself while there has been this uh, recession but there are also 300,000 plus tech jobs which are lying vacant. Worldwide, the skill gap is much higher. So how this situation happened, probably we learned to make use, you know, we, we learned to make hay while the sun shines, but uh, we were not so prompt in skilling ourselves, and that's a message which has to go to all the youngsters who are in this tech field. And of course, the corporates also as to how they can do things differently. And uh, there are loads of other things also to share, but I would just set the context this way that uh, uh, very clearly digital skilling is the way forward because our workplaces have changed. Our workplaces don't look like how it used to look before. And also if you scan the job portals, the jobs that we see today, these are not the jobs we would see 10, 15 years back. So if that's the situation there, we have no option but to upskill and cross-skill. Thank you so very much. Very interesting. On that point, I was asking a youngster very recently, and not just the workplace, the work also has changed. Uh, so uh, I asked him to define work, and he gave a very beautiful answer. He says, work is something which comes in between weekends. <laughs> and that, that, that set me thinking. Uh, so I'm going to move to uh, Innocent Divya, ma'am. Uh, while digital skilling we are talking about, very specific to a corporate or in an educational institution. Uh, the mission that you are in right now, the canvas is so huge. Uh, can, I, can you just throw about what is the government, specific government, especially in Tamil Nadu government in what the project that you are heading, what are you doing in terms of uh, skilling, digital skilling for the workforce or for the student community? If you can throw some light, I think that would be interesting. Thank you so much, Mr. Sujit, for this question, and thank you, NASCOM. I'm privileged to be part of this panel. Uh, my special thanks to Uday and Smita for making this possible. And uh, I head the Tamil Nadu Skill Development Corporation. So previously, skills were uh, very relegated to blue-collar skilling. Usually, skills is always associated to the concept of, you know, industry skilling, uh, shop floor skilling. But I think uh, in the present context that even Rima said, the context that she has said about digital skilling, I think skills has a larger perspective. La skills should not be relegated only to the industry kind of jobs. It should be broad-based, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary. 
So when we got this, uh, when our uh, Honorable Chief Minister inaugurated his visionary program, uh, Nan Mudalman, which means I am the best, it roughly translates into that. So it is a it is a program which is designed for every youth to understand what potential he or she has, and then uh, develop into that kind of an individual, whatever career he has a focus on, to help them develop into that sort of a successful individual, whatever be his uh, career choice, and to make him understand the different options that are there uh, at the at the industry level. What are the different career options, career pathways you have and how you get into those positions and uh, how as a government we are able to facilitate the whole ecosystem. Now this apart, this is one, uh, this is the main objective of the program but within the program what we see is, uh, is that it's not only 10 lakh that the, that the program has set as a target, it's the entire uh, workforce that are there in the higher education space. The, the, the likely workforce that the industry is likely to absorb into their uh, into their positions and uh, as you know education is something uh, which is uh, it, it is a preventive you know you can prevent underemployment unemployment and when you take certain curative steps at that level it has a uh, lasting impact on the future generation so this is what we have um, we, ha we are striving to do through the non modelment program as part of the non modelment program since government is so focused focused on uh, ensuring that the entire uh, uh, you know the, the higher education space be covered what we have done is that we have mandated these programs these digital skilling courses or wherever the student has a focus on it could be medical coding for the for the health sector it could be you know tourism and hospitality courses or tourism and hospitality it could be financial markets or capital markets for the commerce students but wherever possible we have brought it into the credit framework into into the <coughs> universities so it is not just a, a, a course that a student studies and then the, the industry when they observe they will have to reskill and then take them they hire them we are giving them ready talent for you to absorb and whatever possible at your level. We are collaborating with NASCOM at a massive level. NASCOM has come in to collaborate with the non Madan program. They have already certified 54,000 students in the state of Tamil Nadu on their future skills uh, prime portal. So there is a lot of uh, you know focus on this because it is part of the credit, it is part of the CGPA. So the students take it very seriously, not only the students, the entire institution, the entire missionary, you know, the university takes it very seriously. And this is what is possible when the government is focused that, you know, it should be open to the entire canvas, the entire uh, student community that is now there in, across uh, all technical as well as in arts and science universities. Um, I just have a follow-up question because the canvas that you're talking about is huge. If you're talking about a 10 lakh coverage is, is like massive uh, to execute a program of this size I, I'm sure uh, the execution arm should be so strong so if you can just throw some light on how are you partnering with institutions who's helping you skill like NASCOM you said is one of your partners uh, helping you to skill 54,000 students what are some of the challenges that you face and how is the execution arm going on so if you can just help us with some uh, as the Tamil Nadu Skill Development Corporation, we understand one thing, it is not possible to reach out. So we are only a facilitating uh, agency, an organization which will facilitate to bring the industry and the academia together. So we are sort of a bridge between the industry and the academia. It is the industry which is offering these courses. These 23 programs that are offered in engineering colleges in this semester and last semester we did 19 programs. All this is being done by the industry. So the industry brings in their expertise. They bring in their uh, people, you know, to talk about, to train the students in that particular technology. And it is for the industry that they're doing it. It's not that, uh, of course, we're getting a lot of CSR funds. Um, uh, gentlemen, Mr. Harish also is partnered. The Cisco has come in a large way, you know, bringing in CSR funds. IBM has brought in CSR funds. Microsoft has brought in so many majors. Uh, technology majors have brought in CSR funds. But 
all that CSR fund, you know, we, are, we, are, we have that sense of responsibility because we ensure that that doesn't go on waste. They, they spend almost 2,000 to 3,000 per student. But then if the student does not take that program seriously, it, uh, it doesn't mean uh, well for the company too. So that is why it is being brought into the credit framework. And uh, here we have uh, 11 universities, 11 arts and science universities and one technical Diana university uh, with 1478 colleges. And all the students, some program or the other is being, some intervention is being offered in every semester. For example, in the first year, we offer English. Because uh, I, th I think all of you would agree on the human resources side that English is, communication is a major handicap among uh, students when you hire. So we offer that as a cross-disciplinary uh, scaling program for all the first year students. Uh, you know, we are talking about 12.7 lakh students, uh, the whole canvas together. And for all the first year students, that is around 4 lakh students, we are offering this as a compulsory uh, credit program. And for the second year, it's digital skills. So everybody learns, whether he is in BA Tamil or BA English, everybody learns a digital skill. And it is a credit program. And for the third year, the final year in the arts and science, they learn domain related skills. Uh, so as I spoke about, you know, financial literacy or uh, uh, financial <coughs> markets or uh, it could be uh, uh, data analytics for BSc maths and it could be SSSS for statistics. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of domain related. For each of these domains, they relate, they, they, uh, they learn the emerging tech skill while they are in college. So that when the industry comes in for a campus placement, you're already ready. You don't need to, they're available on day one. So that is the kind of uh, uh, success story we brought about. And in engineering colleges, because it's quite uh, fragmented, we offer them uh, relevant skills. You know, if it's a mechanical engineer, he studies about simulation, plant simulation, robotic process automation. UiPath has come in with their uh, CSR funds as well. So it is, uh, there is a sense of responsibility when we use the CSR funds and it is the industry which is offering these programs with the, we've just opened up our universities. What we've done on behalf of the government, we've opened up the universities. So now it is for the industries to come in. Brilliant. I hope the audience heard the number right. 12.7 lakhs is what uh, she's talking about from a one particular state. Uh, and so hats off to what you're doing and we wish you good luck in your mission. Uh, so, I mean, since you spoke so much about the industry uh, coming in to collaborate, my obvious question is to Harish. Uh, so, from the industry side, what are some of the specific initiatives that has worked for Cisco? And if you can talk about, because you've been on the policy, uh, been working with the national government and state government. If you can give us any specific case study um, which uh, Cisco has worked on. Basically. Thanks, Sujit, and again, I want to thank NESCOM for this opportunity. I've been coming to the uh, NESCOM Leadership Forum for the last almost 25 years, and it is uh, great to see a uh, lot of young people. I couldn't recognize most people on, on, in this edition. It is again great to see a lot of young people take the inaugural sessions. Not used to be the case in the past, so that's great. In terms of uh, skill development, it's a huge task. Uh, we all know the statistics that we've got about 500 million people in the task force, in the, in the, in the age group of people who need a job, and only about 15% of them are employable. And if you take engineering people, we've only got about 2% of the people who come out of colleges who are readily employable, so there's a lot of gap, and therefore it is a huge uh, task. And we also know about the statistics that there are almost going to be 2 million jobs in the year 2023 in areas like AI and cyber security and um, blockchain, etc., which are not going to be taken because the skills are not there. So, so again, there's a huge problem and the one piece solution is partnership between the government and industry and academia, yeah. which is what uh, Divya spoke about and that is what we truly believe in. And each one of us bring in our capability. Industry brings bring the domain capability. The government brings the scale and academia, brings in the expertise. And, and Cisco Network Academy is a great example of uh, how we have progressed in our journey. So if you look at Cisco Network Academy, we've been around for almost uh, 35 years. In the first 20 years, uh, we had the model of very high touch. When we used to go into the university, set up our own labs, have our own people teaching, etc. 
and we could do only 600,000 in, uh, in 20 years. Ever since we went on this journey of collaboration, we have ramped up and we have done 700,000 in the last two years. So that's the, the kind of change uh, that, that we are seeing. Uh, and now what we do is focus on our core competency. We bring in the course curriculum, we do the certification, uh, we do the master teacher training. And that's how the scale we are now seeing. Right? And, uh, and we are also doing some lateral collaboration, not only with the government. We also found that there are other organizations who are doing similar work, like to the point again that we mentioned. We now have a program, that we, the CSR program, that we are collaborating with uh, J.P. Morgan and Accenture. And we, we, we found that we are doing similar kind of programs. And why don't we come together and do that? And we train about 115,000 students in that program. I'm specifically, you know, very uh, appreciative of the work that we are doing in Tamil Nadu. She talked about the work that we did there. We signed an MOU with Tamil Nadu government in the now Mudalvan scheme three months ago, I think. And already we have trained about 300 trainers. And we done about, we'll do about 40,000 uh, students in the next 300 quarter. trainers, you Trainers, see. yeah. And, and she told me that we had already done 36,000 students uh, already. So I think that, again, I'm talking about the scale. We're working with uh, other governments like AP, Telangana, and other places, right? And uh, again, I want to say, uh, in, in a sense, it's only that name. She's been guilty of a lot of great work. <laughs> right? So uh, I think we were pretty excited. I mean, talk about skills is not just about, you know, career and learning, etc. It is about, you know, skills for every you know, start of society. We have got a program with an IT foundation called the Cyber Suraksha Program, where we're going to train a million people in cyber security. Some of them are students, others are middle aged old people who need cyber security skills. Otherwise, we find a lot of statistics about elderly people getting uh, defrauded in online. So I think uh, uh, the task is huge, and I think the only way forward is to work together and we're excited about the channel. Thank you. Very, very interesting insights yes. and especially 300 trainers to 36,000 students is like, uh, it's great. I do see a lot of eminent academicians in this hall and few students also. So my obviously next question is to Hari. Um, Hari is the CEO of ICT Academy, uh, a very unique academy I must say that he works both with the industry as well as uh, with the academia to a large extent. So this question is to my, as a representative of the student friend sitting here. Uh, Student to job ready workforce, how can we reduce this journey? And what is ICT Academy doing the, in, in this particular space? Uh, Hari, if you can throw some light. Uh, uh, I'd like to start by thanking NASCOM for inviting me and getting me to sit with such august people here. Uh, about 13 years back, the IT industry went to the government and said, We are not getting sufficient talent that is job ready. And uh, ICT was then formed as a not for profit organization in Chennai uh, to help bridge that gap. Uh, so, we are not a primary education provider, but we only supplement and bridge that gap of skills that industry requires and uh, help the students when they get, uh, when they graduate from the higher education institution to be ready to work on day one. That's what we've been doing uh, for the last uh, 13 years. But happy to tell you that we've touched about 16 million lives so far. And by 2025, we hope that we touch 25 million lives in that journey that many of them are seeking. So we work largely with the institutions which are in tier 2, tier 3, and tier 4 towns to help them bridge that gap, and that's what we do. What we've realized over the 13 years is just not the tech skills that are important. There's a lot of other skills that are very essential to ensure that students find an outcome at the end of uh, their graduation, either an employment or turning themselves into entrepreneurs or pursuing higher education or research, the thing of their choice. So we enable that piece to help these students succeed. So this works in multiple forms. One is that we work on the soft skills part. The soft skills are largely communication, collaboration, ensuring that they have built this purpose of continued learning. Technology is changing so fast that we need to continue learning and adapt ourselves to the uh, new ways of working. So we work with a 4C model, which is ensure critical reasoning, ensure communication, ensure there is um, collaboration within the team, and more importantly, creativity. These are the 4Cs that most of our programs are designed. And we work largely with teachers because teachers are 
in touch with these students 24 bar 7 in the institution. So we work with teachers at the first level. Then they cascade the knowledge downstream to the students and we then supplement it with some industry connect. So any program that we design has instruction, then there is practice, then there's a master class and then finally we wrap it around with an assessment. So I was just at the intersection of ensuring that people are job ready and that's what we did an experiment with TNSDC uh, last year in the seventh semester uh, students of the Anna University which is the premier engineering college there where 60 problem statements were given out to students and students had to form a team of four to seven students and then learn for about 40 hours to solve that problem. At the end they have another 60 hours uh, to solve the problem and submit. Most of this was done on a platform which means uh, they, they had to delegate work to the team members, the team members had to submit work. So individually everyone was evaluated on the project. Uh, 53,954 students participated in this project and 82% completed all six phases of the project which is a very startling number. There's a lot of support that came because the entire problem statement came from industry. Uh, IBM was a partner on that project so they gave us the problem statement. They provided the industry mentors and all of them. This ensured that you know most of the students learned the actual application of knowledge and skills. And today, when they are going to graduate this year and get into jobs, I'm sure they're a lot more prepared than in the past. So the focus was both on the foundation skills, which is problem solving, design thinking, critical reasoning, all of that sequence, and then the technology skills, because the problems were all. AI or cloud or data analytics or IoT related problems. So only students in computer science were <coughs> encouraged to participate in this program and that's how it got completed. I quite endorse Madam Innocent Divya's point that this was a three credit program. So students took it seriously and interestingly three top feedbacks that I want to share when we completed this semester. First was that uh, they understood that they don't start coding from the day they see the problem. They go through an analysis of a problem, they do design, then they plan their work and then delegate and test the solution. So that's the first top feedback that came. So which means the students are now ready when they go to work, they know that they don't start coding on day one. Number two is that many students across in deep down south didn't know of many tools that were there in software. So that helped, helping the students understand what a GitHub is or a Jira or an empathy map is. All this is something that they learned in the process. And the third, which was the most startling one, is that the industry mentor actually enhanced the entire learning process. So I endorsed the theme that we are talking about, is that industry needs to be in the intersection with government and the academia to ensure that the students are job well prepared and they know what is expected of them when they get to work. So this is how we work and prepare the students both in the foundation and the technology Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Dr. Reem, I'm going to call the big elephant in the room right now. And uh, it's a very interesting question that I have for you, something that the industry is facing at large. So we all know that digital transformation is happening and it's happening for real across. But in organization, we always feel that upskilling is not for me. It's for the tech person or it's for the fresher. Sometimes it's for the manager, it's not even for me. Okay. How do you handle a situation like this? What are some of the challenges that you have seen? Uh, if you can share any insights and what's your specific response about why subskilling for is need for everybody and how do we drive this in the organization? And if you can share your insights, that would be helpful. Sure, thank you. So, um, I know there are uh, students also here and that's certainly a community which all of us look forward to, to take the trends forward. So I will, I will share my example. About 25 years back, I was on the engineering shop floor manufacturing Dettol and Lysol for Ekit uh, uh, Ullman, uh, now Ben Kaiser. And I remember my day would start with checking the boiler temperature and the day would end by checking the stock balance which would be there, the raw material balance and all. So one thing I used to ensure that whatever job I was doing, I would know the ins and outs of it. Of course, it's different if you ask me anything now, I won't remember. But the job which is important for me at that point in time, I would give my heart and soul to it. So we have tried to pass on this message right from the start of the talent supply chain 
So some time back, we uh, interacted with almost 25 training and placement officers of engineering colleges across Maharashtra. They were all in our office. And while trying to address the value erosion, you know, which is about all those offers which are with you and you decide not mm -hmm. to join and not even inform the companies. So we started with that and we were trying to figure out uh, where is this thought stemming from? Why do we tend to think that upskilling ourselves is not important and one Java is the be all and end all for me? So that mindset has to change because today people look at combination skills. It's not only Java. People will ask for Java plus Azure. Do you know that? Are you very well informed about the cloud situation that's there? So there is this tendency to always think that it's not for me. Now, why is it important? And Sujit, if you uh, uh, refer to our learning uh, cycle, which is from the phase of um, unconscious incompetence to the stage of conscious competence, all the four cycles that are there, we cannot be in a situation where we speak the same language that we used to speak five years back, right? And people get tired of hearing us because we are saying the same thing. People are not getting anything from us. So this staying relevant is something which is important in every job that we do, right? And somewhere probably to understand this element, it's also important to know about the aspect of uh, empathy, being aware, being agile, something that uh, you brought up a while back. So perhaps that element has to come in, that uh, we have to be far more agile and adaptable to the situation. And if not, uh, we'll be redundant very soon. So I remember about 12 years back, I was talking to a room full of um, uh, engineers in another organization, and we were talking about uh, manual testing versus automation testing. So there was a time when manual testers would think everything is going well for us. So roughly the CTC would be number of years of experience, your CTC would be roughly 1.5 times of that. So we had to speak two languages. One is about the relevance of the skill, and two is, OK, you guys are youngsters. You understand. Everybody understands the language of money. Get into automation testing. It will give you 2.5 times of your experience. Isn't that a much more interesting proposition? So getting that community to move from that mentality uh, took a while. And perhaps that's what we mean when we say that, you know, everything is for others and not for us. Uh, so at Datamatics, we have, um, we, we take this philosophy of learning very seriously. So recently we have done a leadership potential assessment center. So HR folks are aware of the concept of assessment and development centers, where we actually go through a series of tests which is your in-basket or in-trace, business case uh, study and presentation, behavioral event interviews, and at the end of it, uh, we were given our scores as to how we feature uh, in terms of strength, proficiency, and development area in the 10 organizational competencies that have been identified for us. So it's not enough to say that I am a CXO level person and hence I know it all. No. We have an external party which is coming and telling us, hey, you could be great in your role, but gone are the times of Peter Drucker's basic literacy. It's now about appropriate literacy. So I could be from HR, but if I do not have a handle on the financial numbers of margins and EBITDA, then I will not really have a place uh, in the room. Someone else is going to take my place. So this has become very critical. And ultimately, I'm sure we are all on that upwards journey, right? So that's the biggest importance uh, of uh, uh, retooling, reskilling, upskilling, that if we have to be on a growth path, we have to constantly upskill ourselves. Now, which are the skills that I feel should be very critical? Very clearly, data literacy. Very recently, I have enrolled for a data fluency boot camp. You know, uh, why did I do that? Because learning that language, being able to draw insights from data, being able to tell a story from that data is very critical. All right. So similarly, design thinking that you spoke of, design thinking has the power to solve very complex business uh, problems 
in a very lucid way in the most collaborative of manners. And this is also a skill that is available on uh, FSP, uh, Future Skills Prime. So these are some of the things that we are doing and uh, we are also largely using the power of mentorship in the organization. So we have Datamatics Mentorship Program where we have picked up uh, 15 leaders who we know are tech savvy, skill savvy, constantly upgrading themselves and people know that these are the ones who try to stay updated always and they are mentoring some of our key talent who might be very good but to instill in them, to imbibe in them the realization that if you are great at AI and extremely good in the language of Python, AI, ML and all of that, it's not really enough. You have to know the business linkage of the output that you produce. So we are seeing that mentorship is, um, has been very helpful. We are in the early stages of that journey and maybe I'll share more with time. Thank you very much, Rima. I think one thing you put up loud and clear to stay relevant irrespective of what it is stay relevant it's uh, reskilling upskilling any kind of skilling is for you and i think that message is loud and clear thank you so very much i'll move on to my friend harish um, this is about uh, talking about digital skills but what are some of the non-digital skills that are necessary and which complements digital skilling for people so thank you if you can talk about yeah before that i was listening to her and talking about upskilling i remember when I started my career 30 years, I know I'm dating myself. I was the only guy in the company who knew PowerPoint. And then they thought yeah, I was yeah, like, like 30 years. Right? 30. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they made me the IT head of that company. I would not, I would not name it that. And that, that kind of uh, put my career on a different trajectory. And these days I'm writing poetry using chat GPT and people think I'm a, a great poet and I hope nobody in Cisco is listening and give, give me a different job. After that. Yeah, talking about you know like the non-technical skills, I think it is pretty pretty important. I think we you know Hari talked about that, and again I can talk anecdotally. Like you know many years ago, uh, it was an important leader from the government who would send all the you know many of his uh, constituency uh, people to companies like Wipro, Infosys, etc. for interviews, and, and he found that almost all of them got rejected because of his influence. All of them will get interviewed, but. I think uh, they would all get rejected. And when we got into the details, we found that it was about, they were all technically pretty qualified, but they didn't know how to deal with an interview, how to <coughs> confident in a city like Mumbai coming from a small town and so on and so forth. So that's when we got into a conversation and started a finishing school in that rural district. And we saw a dramatic change uh, in, in uh, the results thereafter, how we found lots of these young people who, who then moved to uh, who fared extremely well in interviews and did well. So I think it's very important to have communication skills, uh, you know, ability to empathize, you know, to, to work with teams, etc. I think these are understated and I'm delighted that uh, Hari and his organization is focused on it. It's something that we are very focused on. Uh, we're working with Quest Alliance and NASCOM Foundation, etc. to kind of work on that. We're also in, in kind of working on uh, with NASCOM Foundation on a project called Thinkubator. We were trying to instill a sense of entrepreneurship in students to move away from being just a job seeker to become a job creator and, and amazing to see the kind of impact that program is making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my last question before I throw it open to the audience, um, maybe uh, Hari and ma'am, Ms. Nibia ma'am can take a shot at it. I think digital skilling um, also in a way bridges the economic divide. Right? For example, we are talking about, when you talk about digital skilling for the future and talk about education institution, you have education institutions of different caliber, tier 1, tier 2. There are colleges in tier 3 cities which does, really does not have access either to say campus placements, even quality of faculty for that matter. Like for example, last year, the only discipline that was spoken about in engineering counseling was all about computer science. And uh, earlier it used to be computer science and IT, today we at least have 10 different specialization. Sometimes it also makes me wonder where are the faculty for uh, these programs, for teaching AI and ML and data structures and things like that. Uh, from the specific project that you are heading, uh, do you have any case studies of how digital skilling has which is economic divide? Uh, any case study that you have from tier 2, tier 3 cities, if you can share. And uh, maybe Bala, if you can complement that with uh, what you do on the faculty development space. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is exactly the objective, the entire uh, sum and substance of non mudalmin uh, Because, uh, you know, um, in, um, in Tamil Nadu, uh, engineering is, uh, is an option like arts and science. You know, everybody who doesn't get uh, into medicine goes into engineering as an option, as a next option and then goes into arts and science. So whether there is a passion for the engineering science or not, nobody even wonders at that. But, um, you know, it's a given fact that uh, right now around 3.72 lakh uh, students are undergoing engineering uh, courses. Uh, so what do we do about the employability of these uh, kids? And where are they studying? They are studying in uh, around 472 colleges all over the place, all over Tamil Nadu. They could be in quite very, very rural pockets also. So what about the quality of faculty who are, who are taking these courses for the kids? And what would they turn out to be? You know, they, uh, I think uh, one study mentioned that uh, the, the employability of these engineering graduates is abysmally low. So this is what we have tried to address. Recently when our Chief Minister was in Salem for a regional uh, conference and uh, it was it was a sudden tour that he, he wanted to interact with the students from Nanmudal and whoever is. He said pick up students from colleges, even it, it, it could be uh, government college, private colleges, but do it from rural pockets. I want to know, I want to talk to these students. So we picked them up. They were, no, they were not given, we, had, we did not have the time to even uh, talk to them before the interaction. It was a very, very defining moment when these kids, you know, they were from the second year onwards, second year, third year and the final year. Uh, it was a very, very emotional moment for me where the connect between the student, where he hailed from, where she hailed from. It was a rural uh, village, uh, a hamlet in uh, Salem and that student, you know, those 10 students who were selected to talk, all of them were from different places. And uh, one, uh, they, all of them had the same message that we are from this place. It was a hamlet, the name of the hamlet. And this is what we learned. This is something that we never expected. We are, we were, we thought this would be the second option for us since we get, didn't get into medicine. We had to enroll into a college here. And uh, this is something that came out of the blue. We were not charged anything because it's a mandatory program. But if we had to take this program outside, it would have cost us like thousands. And we were not charged anything. But then the industry, we knew what, we had a peek into what the industry is like. The industry use cases were given to us. We worked on projects. We worked on real-time technology and we worked on real-time use cases. So now we do not have that, uh, you know, we, we know what to, we don't have that fear at all. We know what the industry is like and what kind of an, uh, what kind of skills the employer is looking at and we, I feel, I believe that I have the skills. Whether I get a job or not is something different but I have the confidence. That kind of a confidence, you know, it, it just exuded from each of these students. One particular student who was in second year who had done a Microsoft program, he just said, I have had 10 certificates now, global certifications I have. So I'm sure if, even if I don't get placed in the final year, it is fine because I can do uh, freelancing. That is the confidence that the skills give. And this is not dependent on the infrastructure that the college has. It is not dependent on the faculty that the college has. You know, probably you were talking about the faculty, how are they trained. Um, uh, many of the uh, uh, private colleges may not have that trained faculty, but here as part of the Nan Mudalun, we are also training the faculty. We are not seeking to sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, take them uh, off board. We are trying to complement their efforts. So all of these, uh, you know, 12,000 and odd faculty have been trained in various technology. They have been given global certification. So they have a sense of competence now. They are now confident to facilitate that. Many of them are even, uh, you know, they want to switch over to industry and job roles. But that is fine. It causes a churning. You know, there's a saying that you can't churn the ocean. But we, we've started this. We've started churning the ocean. I think that's a massive uh, revolution in terms of the digital divide that we see. It's not dependent on, because we bring these kids into hubs. We bring them into colleges where there are facilities. We, we ensure that you know they don't travel more beyond 20 kilometers when they come come into these killing spaces. So it is that they've got into uh, they've got into that uh, mindset. They've got into that confidence level. So now I think it's uh, out for them for the industry to take make use of it. 
and how NASCOM as a sector scale council has come in with the entire uh, you know, industry base. I think we would want all other sector councils, uh, uh, sector scale councils to follow suit. Because this is something, this is a major revolution that is happening in the academia today and if industry does not make use of it, I think we would uh, lose big time. So every industry who is looking now for um, skilled manpower should get into the skilling space as well. Whether they are going to hire or not is a different uh, ball game. But then at least they have that kind of a resource which is available in the market. Somewhere, somewhere down the uh, down the cycle, uh, as the uh, you know the when the time cycle flies, you know they will join the other force. So I think that should be the mindset of the industry. Thank you. You want to take a quick thirty seconds? Quick thirty seconds. Uh, first, let me acknowledge I missed it out in the last part that NASCOM was the one who tied up the entire thing with TNSTC, with us, IBM, in the last project that we did with Anna University. I failed to acknowledge their contribution to the project, but. In the, one of our latest projects with Microsoft Philanthropy, we made a very tectonic shift in the way we conduct or execute a project. We first trained about 4,000 teachers on cybersecurity, and the genesis was that the global average of women in cybersecurity is 23, whereas India is only 8%. So we wanted to increase the number of women in cybersecurity. So we first trained the teachers, uh, 4,000 of them. And they cascaded the first level of program to the students. And once the students were trained, some of them who clear, cleared the threshold were given advanced training. And today we are at a stage where we are placing some of the students and they're getting really dream, dream offers that they could probably have never dreamt of having. And a very interesting project because students have felt that they are now ready to face an interview. And it's a great uh, exhilaration for us because we can see the results happening of these students getting placed. Some of them probably even don't have two square meals a day, but they are not going to work for large corporation, and that is very satisfying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we just want to quickly check with the officers. Are you okay to take a, yes. one couple of questions? Anybody has questions to the panelist? <coughs> yes. Yeah. We are talking about higher education. What about school education? Because being an academician, when they come to the first year, if they have some prerequisite at school education level, it would be really great. So I request the panelists, if the CSR funds can be shared to the school education also, it will be so helpful for the higher education. Yeah, uh, I think this is a very relevant question because we are targeting as part of non modelvin we also have a non modelvin schools initiative right now we have started only with career uh, uh, you know mapping uh, career guidance and mapping but uh, in the current in the current uh, next academic year we are planning on giving uh, skills digital skills to the school students as well but here we are able to uh, sort of structure it into a credit program but there it has to be brought into the curriculum. So we are working with the school authorities to see how this can be planned. And it is not only about digital skills, it's about a whole lot of life skills also that are being planned on offering to the school students because that is the foundation. And uh, there are many CSR partners who have come forward in this, but we are sort of trying to structure it because we don't want to use their uh, CSR funds and uh, you know it, it shouldn't be sort of drained on these uh, kids without any outcomes. So we, have, we are working on structuring a program for non modelman for the school students age appropriate at age appropriate levels. So probably in June we would be launching that. I just wanted to add that a lot of um, uh, investments was made during the pandemic to get the teachers in schools, you know, uh, take on uh, technology enabled learning and teaching process. So that is something that we've started and we are scaling that up so that they can use technology, uh, relevant technology when they are using it when in the teaching learning process. So something that we've started, but any other thing I think will require a lot of investment because the curriculum in schools is so very elaborate that you know the time available for the schools to complete that itself is a challenge. Yeah, just taking on from there also, like, we, are, we have a number of interventions in schools and we tend to do it at a very young age. 
to your point that you know, they, they get to class 9, 10, they don't want any distraction from what they are supposed to do, which is again that needs to change too. Uh, and in fact, I was talking to the way about a program that we are doing in Pune and Goa, where we are actually enabling teachers to track every student in the class about how they are progressing on different modules within a very good MIS system. And there is a lot more that we can do. We are also working with schools on cyber security, again at a very young age, and putting in a curriculum on cyber security. So I agree with you that uh, we can do a lot more in schools. Sure. All right, so on that note, uh just take a 30 second, do you want to ask something? Uh, can I just pass on a message to the young audience here? So while we have uh, discussed about the digital skilling, I wanted to uh, inform you, all of the tech hungry people here, so Datamatics in association with Rascom Future Skills Prime has put up its own robotic process automation training suite on Future Skills Prime. There's no cost associated. Anybody from your college who's interested to take that course can go there and take it. By now, we have trained about 2,000 plus uh, across India. We are totally location agnostic. Our hiring numbers in this space are not that high. But it's just that intention and motto of getting India skilled in terms of robotic process automation, wherever there's an interest. So in case you wish this. Thank you. Uh, so quick 30 seconds, I think you had some very interesting views, right? You had Reema presenting what's happening on the industry, Ari is presenting it from the ICT Academy on what they are doing with the student space, Harish again from Cisco and of course, uh, in this I'm presenting her view about what's happening on TNSDC at such a large scale level. Uh, very interesting insight, so I, I just invite you to think over and see what little difference that we can make in our respective organization. But leaving the final message that I want is to what, uh, just take the example that Innocent Divya ma'am spoke about that Salem incident. Uh, because digital skills is all about bridging the digital divide at the end of the day. And, and we all have a responsibility. And that's how I have some massive respect for folks from NASCOM who travel day in and day out, go to colleges, talk about future skills front. Because I also represent a foundation, so I exactly know what Hari uh, speaks about. Uh, I have a kid, I mean it's just only one example a kid who only wanted to study, she wanted to escape from child marriage. Just escape from child marriage. And she she led her life only at two years at a time. And today she works for a brand like Capgemini. Uh, she's been celebrated by the, by the company. And her example is probably a fitting example of what Hari spoke about. And she has never seen a computer in her life. And programs like Future Skills Prime, she, she just hooked on, got hooked on to it. She learned everything from the programs like this. And she studied in a tier 3 institution where I know for a fact there were not good faculty at, at all. And we are working for a global brand. And what, what, what left me very moved is what she said uh, after she got placed. Now in her village, it is this kid who has been shown as a role model as to why you should not get married at a young age. Right? And she says, the, the cutoff limit in my village is 8th standard. At 8th standard, when the girl gets, I mean, attains puberty, and that's it, you stop school, you get married. The groom is already ready. Now she has been shown as a role model. Now look at how it's all gets connected. So I think we have a huge responsibility that way. We can be an inspiration to somebody. So whenever there's an opportunity to visit a tier, tier, tier 3 college or, or virtually, if you can go and talk about digital skills and how you can uh, equip skills for the future, please grab that opportunity. Uh, so my, uh, my, my deepest appreciation to NASCOM and ICT Academy and NSTC and to all those people who are, who are in this particular mission. So it's wonderful sharing this uh, session, moderating the session. I hope you had a great time as well. Back to you, sir. For more interesting content, like, comment, and subscribe to our NASCOM YouTube channel.